नमो भगवती नमो भगवती so hari krishna dear devotees thank you very much for joining today we wanted to seek the blessing of radha mata radha shyam sundar krishna balaram bal gopal singh dev bhagwan goni kaishila pogpat durmaj and the assembled devotees so today is the final session of the bhagavad gita um, chapter 18 so let's have a quick summary of the previous 17 chapters so krishna's main man arjun did not fight <laughs> suddenly he got weakness of heart seeing the opposition and he asked krishna for help in the second chapter and krishna immediately takes him onto the spiritual platform identifies him as the spirit soul that he is also uh, informs about dharma duty and the nature of person who follows dharma then chapter 3 krishna talks about karma yoga how one should do one's duty without attachment to the fruits and set an example to the world and in that way avoid sinful activities and then chapter 4 is um, talks about gyan yoga transcendental knowledge how it's passed down krishna's own mission is revealed in this chapter and the different types of actions karma chapter 5 again is karma yoga but in uh in krishna consciousness so how to perform karma yoga in practice and the effects on the practitioner chapter 6 is dhyan yoga explains about the mind the challenges of astanga yoga how to control the mind and what happens to the unsuccessful yogi so these first six chapters essentially are um karma yoga and then the following six chapters are bhakti yoga and why are they bhakti yoga because krishna then starts to speak a lot about himself and as soon as god is involved in any activity that activity becomes can become bhakti devotion so then krishna explains where he can be perceived in this world in chapter 7 who approaches him who doesn't approach him and the result of worshiping devatas Arjun asks a series of questions in chapter 8 and the last question is about what happens at the time of death and Krishna explains in great detail in wonderful detail uh, about um, the destination of person in, in terms of what happens at the end of his life chapter 9 is uh, confidential information given by Krishna he explains his inconceivable nature and the value of serving him krishna compared to other devatas demigods chapter 10 krishna explains where he can be perceived in this world he gives a lot of information i think it's like uh, quite a few verses he just describes where he can be found in this world chapter 11 is the universal form arjun asks to see this universal form of krishna and krishna shows him it's not easily easy to see that form Krishna doesn't show it often either but this form actually frightens arjun and he realizes the greatness of krishna chapter 12 which is the the end of the bhakti yoga section of the bhagavad gita is all about bhakti yoga and arjun asks a question is it better to worship your personal form or your impersonal form and krishna categorically answers that the process of bhakti yoga of worshiping his personal form is the highest and the best then we have the beginning of the gyan yoga section of the uh, bhagavad gita chapter 13 arjun asks lots of lots of questions about this world about the spirit soul about the super soul and uh, krishna provides the answers about the field the the knower of the field the field is the body the knower of the field is the soul and the material world he also describes a little bit about the spiritual world 14 chapter talks about the three modes of material nature satagun rajagun and tamagun how they act uh the impact they have on us and how to become free of them very important chapter chapter 15 is entitled pushottam yoga and it 
it's a wonderful chapter, only 20 verses, but Krishna explains the nature of the soul. He explains the material world, the, the spiritual world. He also describes himself in relation to uh, souls, other souls. Really classic chapter. Chapter 16, Krishna describes the divine and demoniac qualities. He focuses on the demoniac qualities because he wanted to, he wants to show us what we should avoid. And then yesterday we talked about chapter 17, how the different types of faith, different types of worship according to those faith, that faith, different types of food that we eat, indicating where we stand, different types of charities we can do, austerities, according to the three modes of material nature. And today is uh, the chapter is entitled Conclusion, the Perfection of Renunciation. It's a long chapter, so it will take us a little longer than normal. Chapter 18 is a, is a final summary of the Bhagavad Gita. After systematically outline, outlining various spiritual truths, Krishna offers his Paramam Vacha, his final conclusion. One should take up Bhakti Yoga, the most essential spiritual practice, pretty much outlined in every chapter of this conversation except chapter one. Thus one is offered the opportunity of permanent happiness and fulfillment by the achievement of Krishna or God consciousness, considered the perfection of renunciation. In such consciousness, an individual can smile in, in the face of all situations and circumstances, confident that the smiling Krishna is his constant companion and eternal friend. So the themes of this chapter are as follows. How to work in renunciation. So he's, he's not saying renounce it. He's saying, no, do it. But do it. Do the work without attachment. And what are the five causes of activity? This is a little complicated. Then this talks about the three kinds of knowledge, three kinds of action, three kinds of happiness, according to the modes of nature. Talks about the Vanashram system. And then it gives the final message, which is to surrender and spread the message. So let's make a start. Now, uh, Priyanjali, are you able to read? Yes. Very good. I did not say, oh mighty, I'm the one. I wish to understand the purpose of renunciation, the yagga, and, uh, and of the renounced order of life, sannyasa, O oh, killer of KC demon, master of the senses. So the supreme personality of God had said, the giving up of activities that are based on material desire is what great land men call the renounced order of life, sannyasa. And giving up the results of activities is what the wise call renunciation, tyaga. Some land men declare that all kinds of fruitive activities should be given up as faulty. Yet other sages maintain that acts of sacrifice, charity and penance should never be abandoned. O oh, best of the Bharatas, now hear my judgment about renunciation. O oh, tiger among men, renunciation is declared in the scriptures to be of three kinds. Acts of sacrifice, charity, and penance are not to be given up. They are, they must be performed in deed. Sacrifice, charity, and penance purify even the greatest great souls. All these activities should be performed without attachment or any expectation of result. This should be performed as a matter of duty, O son of Partha. That is my final opinion. Prescribed duty should never be renounced. If one gives up his prescribed duties because of illusion, such renunciation 
is said to be in the mode of ignorance. Anyone who gives up prescribed duties as troublesome or out of fear of bodily bodily discomfort is said to have renounced in the mode of passion. Such action never leads to the elevation of renunciation. O oh, Arjuna, when one performs his described duty, prescribed duty, only one because it ought to be done and renounces all material association and all attachment to the food. His renunciation is said to be in the mode of goodness. The intelligent renouncer situated in the mode of goodness, neither hateful of inauspicious work nor the auspicious work has no doubts about work. It is indeed impossible for an embodied being to give up all activities. But who renounces the fruits of action is called one who has truly renounced. For one who is not renounced, the three old fruits of action, desirable, undesirable, and mixed, accrue after death. But those who are in the renounced order of life have no such result to suffer or endure. O mighty Andrajana, according to the Vedanta, there are five causes for the accomplishment of all action. Now learn of these from me. The place of action, the body, the performer, the various senses, the many different kinds of endeavor, and ultimately the super soul. These are the five factors of action. Whatever right or wrong action a man performs by body, mind, or speech is caused by these five factors. Therefore, one who thinks himself the only doer, not considering the five factors, is certainly not intelligent and cannot see things as they are. One who is not motivated by false ego, whose intelligence is not entangled, though he kills men in this world, does not kill, nor is he bound by his actions. Knowledge, the object of knowledge, and knower are the three factors that motivate action. The senses, the work, and the doer are the three constituents of action. Well done. That's a lot of verses that you read, Priyanjali. Thank you very much. And Krishna's explained a lot in these verses. Uh, he's saying, some people think, give up everything, give up all fruitive activities, because they're all faulty. But then other sages say, no, you should do sacrifice, charity, and penance. And he's saying, yes, you should. You should do it, but don't be attached to it, thinking that you are doing it. And then he explains, actually, there are five factors uh, of action. So let's talk about that. If working in this world seems to attract karmic reaction and implicates us in a web of worldly complexity, is it not safer then that we give up work? Just don't do anything. <laughs> Krishna disagrees. He reiterates that activity is not bad per se. The root of entanglement is the false ego with which we perform the activity thinking ourselves, the controller and enjoyer. So because we're thinking we are the doers, I am entitled to enjoy and I'm entitled to control. In reality, there are five causes which bring success to any activity. So what are these five causes? The individual soul, okay? The soul is there. Without us, there wouldn't be a body. <laughs> so we are a, a cause 
but not the only cause. The senses, the senses like the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, skin, five senses. The endeavor, the endeavor essentially is the desire to do something and the super soul. So all these five are needed in order for anything to happen. The super soul, he um, allows the act to take place. It's not that he does the act, he allows it to take place. Since we are only one of the five, we should never have an overvalued estimation of ourselves. Thus by working in a spirit of detachment, offering the fruits of labor, Towards a transcendental goal, one can function in this world and simultaneously remain completely aloof. So this is quite important. He does describe this a few times in the Gita. The sense of detachment is very important. So we can try to understand these five factors of action. The soul, the body, because without the body we couldn't do anything. And we need the senses because the senses are, you know, the knowledge acquiring senses or they are senses which need to um, be looking for sense objects in order for the body to function. The endeavor is the effort, and the desire and the super soul, the super soul being the one who gives the go ahead, he gives the approval for the act to take place. So, right, Devina, would you like to read? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Devina. According to the three different modes of material nature, there are three kinds of knowledge, action and performer of action. Now hear of them from me. <clears throat> that knowledge by which one undivided spiritual nature is seen in all living entities, though they are divided into in innumerable forms you should understand to be in the mode of goodness that knowledge by which one sees that in every different body there is a different type of living entity you should understand to be in the mode of passion and that and that knowledge by which one is attached to one kind of work as the all in all without knowledge of the truth and which is very meager is said to be in the mode of darkness that action which is regulated and which is performed without attachment, without love or hatred and without desire for fruitive results is said to be in the mode of goodness. But, but, actions perform, but action performed with great effort by one seeking to gratify his desires and enacted from a sense of false ego is called action in the mode of passion. That action performed in illusion, in disregard of spirit of scriptural injunctions and without concern for future bondage or for violence or distress caused to others is said to be in the mode of ignorance. One who performs his duty without association with the modes of material nature, without false ego, with great determination and enthusiasm and without wavering in success or failure is said to be a worker in the mode of goodness. The worker who is attached to the work and the fruits of work, desiring to enjoy those fruits, and who is greedy, always envious, impure, and moved by joy and sorrow, is said to be in the mode of passion. The worker who is always engaged in work against the injunctions of the scripture, who is materialistic, obstinate, cheating, and expert in insulting others, and who is lazy, always morose in procrastinating, is said to be a worker in the mode of ignorance. O winner of wealth, now please listen as I tell you in detail of the different kinds of understanding and determination according to the three modes of material nature. O son of pra Prata, that understanding by which one knows that ought to be done and what ought not to be done, what is to be feared and what is not to be feared, what is binding and what is liberating, is in the mode of goodness. O son of Prata, that understanding which cannot distinguish between religion and irreligion, between action that should be done and action that should not be done, is in the mode of passion. That, that understanding which considers ir irreligion and 
that the under that understanding which considers irreligion and to be religion and religion to be irreligion irreligion under the spell of illusion and darkness and strives always in the wrong direction o son of parata is in the mode of ignorance o son of parata the determination which is unbreakable which is sustained with the steadfastness by yoga practice and which thus controls the activities of the mind life and senses it is determination in the mode of goodness but that determination by which one holds fast to fruitive results in in religion economic development and sense gratification is of the nature of passion o arjun and that de- and that determination which cannot go- which cannot go beyond dreaming fear- fearfulness lamentation morosness and illusion such unintelligent determination O son of Prata is in the mode of darkness. O best of Bharatas, now please hear from me about the three kinds of happiness by which the conditioned soul enjoys and by which he sometimes comes to an end of all distress. That that which in the beginning may be may be just like poison, but at the end but at the end is just like nectar and which awakens one to self-realization is said to be happiness in the mode of goodness that happiness which is derived from contact of the senses with their objects and which appears like nectar at first but poison at the end is said to be of the nature of passion and that happiness which is blind to self-realization which is delusion from beginning to end and which arises from sleep laziness and delusion is said to be the nature of ignorance there is no existing there is no exist, existing either here or among the demigods in the higher planetary systems which is freed from these three modes born of material nature wow <laughs> well done yeah, <laughs> thank you a, Hare Krishna. that was a long session well done yeah. for reading that so nicely so he talks about happiness in the three modes he talks about understanding uh, uh, our understanding in three modes uh, talks about um, how our work can be in the three modes, talks about our knowledge can be in those three modes. So it gives a lot of information. These three modes really have a big influence in our life. They control everything within our life. So let's have a quick look at the summary. Looking around us, the reality is that most people are deeply engrossed within this material world. Nobody really has an idea that we are spirit souls having a material experience. So the vast majority are living under illusion, thinking that we are the body, but we're not the body. Krishna uh, said that right from the beginning. Krishna pins this down to the modes of material nature that entangle each person according to their individual mentality. Krishna explains how the modes influence our knowledge, actions, understanding, determination, ultimately our sense of happiness. So what's there to learn? It's a huge lesson here. What seems like poison in the beginning will become nectar in the end. And what is nectar in the beginning, sense enjoyment, will be poison in the end. For example, if you had a plate full of gulab jamuns and you eat one, very nice. You eat two, it's okay. Three, okay, I think I've had enough. Four, mm, eat a fifth gulab jamun, you feel sick, right? So this is the point about Happiness in the mode of passion is great in the beginning, but it's going to be poison in the end. However, if we're looking at happiness in the mode of goodness, it can be potentially poison in the beginning. And the example is of mantra meditation. When we try to meditate, it's so hard. And the mind is all over the place. But we keep trying, we keep pursuing the object of controlling the mind. And in due course of time, if we do achieve that control over the mind, then we 
our happiness is turned into nectar, becomes nectar. Why? Because nothing can, um, nothing can disturb us. We are so fixed uh, in the mantra meditation. And we're so enjoying it. Even though it was poison in the beginning, it's nectar in the end. So, lesson is that don't go for temporary happiness when there's a higher goal in mind. The higher goal may take some time to achieve, may be hard in the beginning, but in the end, it's nectar. Just like if you're going for a, you know, a profession. You have to make sacrifices. It's going to be hard. You're going to study hard. But in the end, you'll enjoy the fruits of that. Of course, Krishna explains that we shouldn't try to enjoy the fruits because it's not really our fruits. <laughs> but besides that being said, work hard. Work hard at, uh, and specifically work hard on your self-realization, understanding who you are. Because as I said before, vast majority, 99.99% of this world, people are thinking that they are the body. So this illusion is very deep-rooted. Okay. Oh, this is just uh, giving that example of happiness in goodness. Poison in the beginning, nectar in the end. The many rules and regulations control the mind and the senses. They might appear bitter in the beginning. But a successful transcendental realization is like nectar. It awakens one to self-realization. So I um, would like to read. Um, Jay Shri, your son would like to read, maybe? Yes. Okay. Bhamanas, Sakyas, Vaisas, and Sutras are distinguished by the qualities born of their own natures in accordance with the material modes, O Shastras of the enemy. Peacefulness, self control, austerity, purity, tolerance, honesty, knowledge, wisdom, and religiousness. These are the natural qualities by which the Brahmanas work. Heroism, power, determination, resourcefulness, courage in battle, generosity, and leadership. The natural qualities of work for the Kasachas. Farming, cow protection, and business are the natural work for the Vaisas and for the Sudras. There are labor and service to others. By following the qualities of work, every man can become perfect. And please hear from me how this can be done. By worship of the Lord, who is the source of all beings and who is all pervading, a man can attain perfection through performing his own work. It is better to engage in one's own occupation, even though one may perform it imperfectly, than to accept another's occupation and perform it perfectly. Duties prescribed and fall into one's nature are never affected by sinful reactions. Every endeavor is covered by some fault, just as fire is covered by smoke. Therefore, one should not give up the work born of his nature, O son of Kunti, even if such work is full of fault. Mm. One one who is self-controlled and unattached and who disregards all the material enjoyments can obtain a practice of renunciation, the highest perfect stage of freedom from reaction. O son of Kunti, learn from me how one is, who has achieved this perfection can attain to the supreme professional stage, Laman, the stage of highest knowledge by acting in the way I should now summarize. Uh, yep, yeah, carry on for in a minute, but I just wanted to focus in on this verse here. Krishna is so kind, you know. He says, look, every act is covered by some fault, just as fire is covered by smoke. So don't worry. Don't give up. Uh, whatever you meant to do, just continue doing it, even if such work is full of fault. This is really amazing uh, verse by Krishna. Please carry on. Being purified by its intelligence and controlling the mind of determination, giving up the objects of sense gratification, being free from attachment and hatred, one who lives in a secluded place, who eats little, who controls his body, mind, and power of speech, who is always entranced and who is detached, free from false ego, false strength, false pride, lust, anger, and acceptance of material things, free from false proprietorship and peaceful. Such a person is certainly elevated to the position of self-realization. Mm. 
One who is thus transcendentally situated at once realizes the supreme Brahman and becomes fully joyful. He never laments or desires to have anything. He is equally disposed towards every living entity. In that state, he attains pure devotional service unto me. One can understand me as I am, as the supreme personality of Godhead, only by devotional service. And when one is in full consciousness of me by such devotion, he can enter into the kingdom of God. Brilliant. Thank you. So is that was that Neil or Nanda? It was Neil. Okay. Thank you so much, Neil. Very good. Very good. Have you kept up, by the way, with the Gita sessions? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Oh, well done. And Nanda as well? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Oh, well done. Thank you so much. It's because of you two, I started these things. <laughs> so yeah. thank you so much. Wonderful. Well done. Thank you. This is a classic verse. Uh, number 55. Bhaktiya Mama Bijanati. Fantastic verse. Because Krishna explains, look, I can be understood as I am. Only by bhakti. And what is bhakti? Bhakti means loving devotional seva to the Lord. And when one is in such consciousness of him through this devotion he can enter into the kingdom of god classic verse okay we are expected to be aloof and unattached workers but in reality we have a conditioned nature conditioned nature means you know we're used to living in this material world and being attached to it influenced by the modes which implicates us in worldly life Krishna thus explains a system of Varnashram where one can engage one's inherent nature in different types of work. So he talks about the Brahmins, which is like the intellectual class, the priests and the professors. He talks about the Kshatriyas, the politicians, the military men. He talks about the Vaish, the, the mercantile class, businessmen. Shudras, the laborers, the, the work. Now, we shouldn't think that there is a higher and lower in these system, in this class system. According, uh, uh, unfortunately, the caste system was exploited, and they um, went to the level of if you are born a Brahmin, you are a Brahmin. But that's not what Krishna says. In the fourth chapter, he describes how this Nashram system works. It depends on your nature and your qualities of your behavior. So if you behave like a crazy fellow, you're a crazy fellow, you're not a Brahmin. <laughs> so um, this is a natural way how society is actually um, functioning. If you look at the society here in the UK, um, it's not that if you're born as a son of a doctor, you're automatically going to be a doctor. You have to work hard in order to get the proper qualifications to be a doctor. And this is what it's all about, having the right qualifications. Uh, um, and a society where, which, where, where it, they have all these different divisions functions very well. In Russia, for example, they try to ban the different uh, classes. But how is it possible? They still had the professors and the churchmen. They still had the warriors. They still had the businessmen. They still had the, the, the workers. So it's, no society functions without these four categories. And why? Because God has created those categories. That's what he explains in the fourth chapter. It's just like our body needs a head arms, legs, stomach, right? The society needs these four types of people. One need not artificially imitate another man's duty, but rather embrace what is natural and inborn by engaging our nature and discharging work in a spirit of God consciousness. We purify ourselves of material propensities and live a happy and peaceful life. So, what's to learn here? Understanding this Varnashram system. There's two parts to it. Varna, 
is this, the social divisions, and then there's the ashram. Ashram are the divisions based upon spirituality, beginning with brahmachari, celibate life, then married life, grahastha, and then we have uh, the vanaprastha, semi-retired, and then we have the sannyas, where one gives up one's attachment to society. This one ashram system, all these these eight diff these uh, four by four different systems work together, in, and when they're together in a society functioning well, that society will do very well. So we need to understand this one ashram system, how it applies to us both individually and collectively. So this is a separate exercise that needs to be done at some point to understand where are we. In which particular class do we fit in, and what is our duties, and what is our um, which stage of life are we at? So the last bit now, and oh yeah, here it is. This is uh, this is the Brahmins, the Kshatriyas, the warriors, the um, Vaish, and then the Shudras. So Krishna explains that. that uh, they're distinguished by the qualities born of their own natures, according to the mortal nature. So last bit now. Rohan, would you like to read? Very beautiful. Brilliant, thank you. Though engaged in all kinds of activities, my pure devotee under my protection reaches the eternal and imperishable abode by my grace. In all activities, just depend upon me and work always under my protection. In such devotional service, be fully conscious of me. If you become conscious of me, you will pass over all the obstacles of conditioned life by my grace. If, however, you do not work in such consciousness, but act through false ego, not hearing me, you will be lost. If you do not act according to my direction and do not fight, then you will be falsely directed by your nature. You will have to. You will have to be engaged in warfare. Under illusion, you are now declining to act according to my direction, but compelled by the work born of your own nature, you will act all the same, O son of Kunti. The supreme Lord is situated in everyone's heart, O Arjuna, and is directing the wanderings of all living entities who are seated as on a machine made of material of the material energy o sign of bartha surrender unto him in unto him utterly by his grace you will attain transcendental peace and the supreme and eternal abode thus i have explained to you knowledge still more confidential deliberate on this fully and then do what you wish to do because you are my dear friend, my very dear friend, I'm speaking to you, my supreme instruction, the most confidential knowledge of all. Hear this from me, for it is for your benefit. Always think of me, become my devotee, worship me and offer your homage unto me. Thus you will come to me without fail. I promise you this because you are my very dear friend. Abandon all varieties of religion and surrender unto me. I shall deliver you from all sinful reactions. Do not fear. Uh, you can carry on in a minute. I just wanted to reflect on a, a few verses here, really classic verses. Here, Krishna says to Arjun, so have you been listening? <laughs> have you been listening? And if you have been listening, think about what I've said and then do what you want. This is the Lord, right? He's never going to force us he, he gives us this, um, this free will, although it's a little minute, <laughs> it is still there. So he's saying to Arjun, he's confirming it here, look, you listen to, you, you've heard what I've said, think about it, but then you can do whatever you want. This is, this is the mercy of the Lord. And then he explains um, this verse, uh, 65, he says it twice in the Gita. Um, and it's a wonderful worth because he's expressing in summary how to reach him. Think of him, become his devotee, worship him, offer homage unto him. 
we will go to him without fail. I promise you this because you're my dear friend. And then 66 is a, a, a verse which often is regarded to be the conclusion of the Bhagavad Gita. Give up all varieties of religion. I mean, God is saying, give up all varieties of religion. Sarva Dharma Parityaja. And just surrender unto me. I shall deliver you from all sinful reactions. Do not fear. So, one thing is for sure. If we surrender unto Krishna... He will protect us. He may not protect this body because his body is not that important. We are important, the soul, the spirit soul. That's what he'll always protect. Okay, please carry on. This confidential knowledge may never be explained to those who are not austere or devoted or engaged in devotional service, nor to one who is envious of me. For one who explains this supreme secret to the devotees, pure devotional service is guaranteed, and at the end he will come back to me. There is no servant in this world more dear to me than he, nor will there ever be one more dear. And I declare that he who studies this sacred conversation of ours worships me by his intelligence, and one who listens with faith and without envy becomes free from sinful reactions, and attains the, to the auspicious planets where the pious dwell. O son of Bhartha, O conqueror of wealth, have you heard this with an attentive mind? Are you, are, and are your ignorance and illusions now dispelled? Okay, just one more minute. We'll just uh, meditate on a couple of verses. This is really nice. Krishna says, one who explains this supreme secret, so this Bhagavad Gita, one who shares it with others, pure devotional service is guaranteed. <laughs> At the end, he will come back to me. And then he, he re-emphasizes it. There's no servant in this world more dear to me than he, nor will there ever be one more dear. So this is really powerful statements by the Lord. So, you know, we've tried to share the Bhagavad Gita, and we've tried to also give this information in a concise way for you to share it with others. I am hoping that, um, and we always strive to do this, that we also uh, encourage others to spread this knowledge because it's so powerful. So learn it, absorb it, um, Meditate on it, put it into practice into your life, and share it with others. This is so important. And look at the look at what Krishna is saying. There is no servant in this world more dear to me than he. <laughs> These are really emphatic statements, you know. And then again, he emphasizes: Have you heard this with an attentive mind? <laughs> Krishna is questioning him. Okay, over to you. Arjuna said, My dear Krishna, O invaluable one, my illusion is now gone. I have regained my memory by your mercy. I am now firm and free from doubt and am prepared to act according to your instructions. Sanjaya said, hmm. Thus have I heard the conversation of two great souls, Krishna and Arjuna. And so wonderful is the message that my hair is standing on end. By the mercy of Vyasa, I have heard those these most confidential talks directly from the master of all mysticism, Krishna, who was speaking personally to Arjuna. O king, as I repeatedly recall this wondrous and holy dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna, I take pleasure being thrilled at every moment. O king, as I remember the wonderful form of Lord Krishna, I am struck with wonder more and more, and I rejoice again and again. Wherever there is Krishna, the master of all mystics, and wherever there is Arjuna, the supreme archer, there will also certainly be opulence, victory, extraordinary power and morality. That is my opinion. Wonderful. Thank you. That's the conclusion. That's the end. Very beautiful verses. So, some in conclusion, all the activities, practices, and elements of spirituality 
are ultimately aimed at achieving pure love of God, right? That's what we're trying to do, trying to love God. That's what's the missing factor. We've forgotten God. Now we want to try to reestablish that connection with God. The highest realization in transcendental knowledge is to reestablish one's loving relationship with the Supreme Personality of God. So Srila Prabhupada, he, he writes this uh, in, the, in one of the purports. Uh, he gives this explanation. He sums it all up beautifully. The most confidential part of knowledge is that one should become a pure devotee of Krishna. Or Rama, or Nasingha, you know, one of the incarnations of God. And always think of him and act for him. One should not become an official meditator. <laughs> Life should be so molded that one will have, uh, one will always have the chance to think of Krishna. So, for example, on your desk when you're working, studying, you have a picture of Krishna. One should always act in such a way that all his daily activities are in connection with Krishna. He should arrange his life in such a way that throughout the 24 hours he cannot help but think of Krishna. <laughs> Might be difficult in the beginning, but it's possible. And the Lord promises, the Lord's promise is that anyone who is in such pure Krishna consciousness will certainly return to the abode of Krishna where he will be engaged in the association of Krishna face to face. So what's the lesson? Understand the philosophy, right? It's not difficult. We've gone through it. Some people say Gita is very hard, but it's not hard at all. It's magnificent. It's beautiful. Live the philosophy. That may take some time. That's okay. It may get, take some time to adjust our lifestyle, to live according to the Gita. That's fine. No problem. But just because it was spoken 5,000 years ago, it doesn't mean it's not relevant today. It is as relevant today as it was then. And spread the philosophy. Share it with others. You know, if you have something wonderful, you want to share it with the world, right? Don't want to just keep it to yourself. Especially when that wonderful thing increases as you share it more. <laughs> so this is the conclusion. And... Let's uh, have a look at the question. Let's take some questions. Please ask whatever questions. Uh, I'll just look at the Priyanjali. If he says there will be no dear devotee than him, then why did God say all devotees are dear to me? For example, Uddhav, the devotee of Krishna, the dearest one, he said, yeah, he has, he, everybody's his favorite, but he has some who are even more favorite. <laughs> Udav is one of them, for sure. But more than Udav are the gopis. More than all of the gopis. Sorry, more than Udav are his parents. They're more favorite than Udav. More uh, favorite than his parents are his gopi friends. And amongst the gopi friends, the most favorite is Radha Rani. But at the same time, this is, the, this is why he's God. He loves every one of us. We are all his favorite. When the, when the cowherd boys were having a picnic with Krishna, every day they would have a picnic in the forest. Each of the cowherd boys, they would be looking at Krishna and they would be thinking, Krishna's only talking to me. He's only looking at me. And there were thousands of gopas, thousands of friends. They were all thinking, Krishna is just looking at me. He's only paying attention to me, nobody else. This is the beauty of God. He can give his attention to every one of us. But I love it when he says in the Bhagavad Gita that the one who shares the knowledge is his favorite. And there's nobody more dearer to him. What about Srinathji? Yeah, Srinathji is Krishna. Srinathji is the one with the left hand is lifting Govardhan with his little finger. That's Krishna. 
That is one and the same. One and the same. No, there's nothing unfair, uh, Priyanjali. God is fair to everyone. He's fair to everyone. Any more questions? Then why, more questions? Then why does she have favorites? Everybody's his favorite. <laughs> Everybody's his favorite. You're his favorite as well. But there are certain devotees who are so close to him, they conquer him. They, yeah. they love him more than he loves them, which is impossible anyway. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes, Prabhuji. Yes. I keep saying something. I'm going to tell you confidential knowledge, which is more confidential than what I have told you in the past. He keeps repeating this. That is more confidential, more confidential. So what do we understand by that? Mm. For us, everything sounds confidential. Very true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. very, confidential. very true, very true. I think he sums it up at the end, you know, that bit of a bhakti amama bijanati yavan yachas tato tato He says something like, you know, only by devotional service one can understand him as he is. Mm. And through that devotion, one can always remember him and go back to him. So, yes, he keeps saying this is confidential. But the thing is, this is all quite hidden. The message of the Bhagavad Gita, if you see, it's not really out there, right? It's not really out there. No. But it's a very simple message. But it's very confidential. Because people are not willing to listen to that message. They're not willing to take the time to understand this message. That's why it's confidential. Um, <clears throat> the Vedas are very vast. Mm. And part of the Vedas is like the Ithyasis and all that. All of that comes within the overall scripture, scriptures. But it's very vast. It's very big. It's very huge. So it's, if you like, you can get lost in Vedanta and so many other scriptures, Mahabharata, Ramayana. But the essence is in the Gita and he's given it to us in a very con nice way. But it's confidential because it can be easily, you can easily lose it, you know. You can never easily find it. So somehow, if one is inclined towards reading these words of Krishna or understanding these words of Krishna, then one is in a very, very strong position, very favorable position. And it's confidential because although it's out there, we're not actually able to absorb it. We think there's something better than this. But there isn't. Okay. Does that make sense? Not many people know about it, isn't it? It's not that. Yeah. Is it equivalent to that? Yeah, yeah. It, they may know about the Gita. They may know Krishna spoke these words. Yeah. But they haven't dwelled into oh. what was actually oh. spoken. Okay, not much about inside have, knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Or if they have uh, read it, they may have misinterpreted it, you know. There's so, so many interpretations of the Gita. So he, he, it's confidential in many, in, or on many levels. It can be easily misinterpreted. It can mm. be not easily understood. So in many different levels, it's, uh, it's confidential. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Papuji. Thank okay. you very much for you. such taking us through 18 chapters in a very sort of way that we can understand. Thank you. No, thank you so much for participating. As always, as you know, you already understand everything in a very deep way. So <laughs> thank you for joining us. Thank and you, Papuji. Helping. So now... Um, we, in, in the Vedic knowledge, the way the Gurukul system works is that we don't charge. We don't ask people for donations or money. But um, in order for the Vedic knowledge to actually pass from, um, from teacher to student, there should be some Guru Dakshina. Now, I don't want any Guru Dakshina. But when you go to the temple next... Put something in the temple and just pray to the Lord. My dear Lord, we went through the Bhagavad Gita. Please 
let that knowledge become wisdom within me and put something, some Lakshmi, take some fruit, whatever you like, whatever's easy for you. Um, and in that way, you, have, you will be fulfilling um, the Vedic tradition whereby the teacher is given something by the disciple. But you know my disciples, but um, I'm just guiding you a little bit through, through the Gita. Um, but just remember and just ask him, please bless this, this foolish person called Nabinandan <laughs> so that he can become a better devotee. So if you can do that, that would be really, really appreciated. Can do something to the live, isn't it? Sorry? You can donate something to the live. Yeah, you can donate something to the live. At the moment, we are doing... Um, you know, we, there are many things happening, like uh, we're doing the sari gifts to the bridge mm -hmm. buses. We're educating the girls in Pindavan. That, that's like 200 pounds for a whole year. A, ho a girl would be educated in the education system there. Um, but, you know, whatever one wants to do, I, I'm really happy for you to... Uh, uh, do but give something because if you give something then that Vedic knowledge will transfer, will pass on to you thank you Prabhu for telling thank us that it's <laughs> true yeah. no, thank you thank you so much thank you. Uh, so <laughs> actually you are not foolish Prabhu, <laughs> thanks to you we have learned so much and uh, unfortunately, I'm still a fool. <laughs> what to do? <laughs> I've learned Hard so to change, many. but anyway, what to do? Now, thank you so much. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for Neil and uh, Nanda. Thank you for Rohan. The youngsters, especially, are very happy. Um, De Devina, uh, the Priyanjali, amazing Priyanjali, always ready to read. I love your attitude. And Sanvi and Sanchi, they're not here today, but uh, they've been participating very, very nicely. And uh, Jeshri, your younger son as well, I can't remember his name, thanking you for Thank you. him. So what is his name again? It's Priyan. Priyan, that's right. That's right. <laughs> very good. Well, thank you. Thank you, all of you. And um, now next week, uh, let me just stop this. Bhagavad Gita ki.